Hello my friends and welcome back to another Baldur's Gate 3 character building guide. Hope you're all doing well. Today I'm going to be covering a subject that I think does not get enough love when people are talking about character building and character optimization, skills. Skills are a critically important factor to every character and every party composition, and having the access to the right skills in your party will make the difference between having a smooth and easy run and having a very difficult run. There are certain skills that every party needs access to, and certain skills that are functionally or completely useless in Baldur's Gate, and knowing which to prioritize and which to avoid I think is really important. I've set this up as a tier list because everyone loves a tier list, it gives us all something to argue about, and as RPG players, of course, we love nothing more than to argue about marginalia. So, so let's jump right into it and talk about the skills. I've set this up as six distinct tiers because I think there are six distinct tiers, six distinct power levels of skill. There are skills that are by themselves completely game-winning. I'll leave it as an exercise to see if you can guess which one is going to go there. Skills that are critically important for every party to have access to that will be that will make your run significantly more difficult if you don't have access to it. It's not impossible to play without these, but every party in almost every playthrough, unless you're going for a specific challenge, is going to want to have access to these skills. There are skills that are very important and will make a number of encounters quite a lot easier and will come up quite frequently. Skills that are marginal but useful, and or skills that are, are useful but you can definitely get by without them. Skills that are extremely marginal, they do technically have some uses, but you can certainly skip them if it's not something that you easily have access to. And skills that are genuinely completely useless because you can bypass their effects completely using some other method during the game. One other thing that I should mention is that I will occasionally be referencing a Neoseeker guide that has a list of the number of each skill check that occurs throughout Act 1. I think it only goes up to Act 1 because it was made during early access. And while I can't personally vouch for the exact um, accuracy of this guide, I think it's a very useful resource because it will show you the, the at least the rough proportion of skill checks that will come up, so I'll link it in the description, and I'll mention occasionally when some skills that you might not expect come up way more or way less frequently than you would otherwise consider. One thing that I think is tempting when you're talking about skills is to treat groups of similar skills as being all the same, and so looking at whether that's actually true, whether they come up more or less often, will let us make better, more informed decisions when we're actually going to build our party, and also the difference between types of skill checks matters a lot. Sometimes Some skill checks can bypass entire encounters or completely solve a certain problem, and those are really important to be able to succeed on, whereas some just give you a marginal amount of XP, maybe an inspiration or something like that, and so are nice to have, but not uh, critically important for making sure that you win fights or make it through your run unscathed. Okay, so let's talk about each individual skill. You'll have to forgive me here for the, the visual. This was the, the most visually appealing tier list I could find um, on the internet, but it does look like whoever put this together had some cropping issues with these skills. But it was this or just black text on a white background, so I went with this one. Well, first up, athletics. I've ordered the skills, of course, in the order they appear in your character sheet, so you'll have strength skills, then dex skills, then con skills, although there aren't any, then intelligence, wisdom, and charisma in that order. How athletics works is it is used for two major checks in the game. One is pushing enemies, and one is being pushed. Just like acrobatics, athletics, whichever is higher, will help you resist being pushed um, when an enemy attempts to push you. But unlike acrobatics, athletics is used to push enemies when you use the shove bonus action. I think there's like maybe one or two dialogue checks where athletics shows up, but almost entirely the use of this skill is to push or avoid being pushed. So how important is that? The answer is extremely. The ability to reposition enemies in combat is one of the most powerful tools you have in your arsenal, and being able to do that as a bonus action, meaning you're going to use a, a turn resource that you wouldn't otherwise necessarily have a good use for on your characters, um, 
is extraordinarily powerful and useful. Not to mention that being able to push enemies can sometimes just one-shot them if you push them into a cavern, you ca uh, into a chasm. You do give up loot when you do that, but for certain important combats, this can be extremely powerful and can get you out of risky situations. You can use shove to move an enemy away from threatening a vulnerable ally. You can use shove to reposition enemies into dangerous areas, whether... Um, you have, say, a wall of fire or a plant growth on the ground that you're pushing them into. Pushing enemies onto ice surfaces is also incredibly powerful because then they will have to make their check to avoid falling prone on their next turn, which could cost them their entire turn. So there are tons of different uses for athletics. Um, just the ability to move enemies around is incredibly strong. And then that's not even counting that it also helps you avoid being pushed. And the characters that get at access to athletics are the characters that most want to avoid being pushed because they're typically your strength-based melee characters. Enemies will often try to shove your character away from themselves in order to reposition without taking an attack of opportunity, in order to make a ranged attack without taking disadvantage, or even just in order to get your character further away from them so that they can make a little distance and prevent you from attacking. Having access to athletics prevents them from doing that, which means that you are going to be able to much more easily keep your melee characters stuck to enemy vulnerable ranged characters or wizards or whatever, making sure that you'll always maximize your attacks of opportunity. Something I talk a lot about in um, character optimization is that every character has access to five resources every single turn of combat. Your action, your bonus action, your reaction, your movement, and your concentration. Athletics gives you two of these um, because it works with the bonus action shove, and it also guarantees that you'll be able to make an attack of opportunity on your reaction because it stops the enemy from pushing you away, preventing you from hitting them if they then try to leave. So it gives you... Athletics will help you maximize use of your turns by virtue of having that, and basically every character that has access to athletics should take it. Even if you have low strength, it's super useful um, in all kinds of circumstances. Acrobatics, on the other hand, while it is very useful for you to avoid being shoved for all the reasons I just talked about, it is significantly less valuable than athletics. It never comes up in dialogue, or almost never, functionally never comes up in dialogue, and it only helps you resist being shoved, not shove, and there's no other check that it gets applied to in the game. The characters that can take acrobatics are much less likely to care about being shoved, because you are probably going to be a ranged character of some description um, if you have access to acrobatics, and so you are less likely to care about being pushed away from an enemy. That's something that you really don't mind, usually. And the, the AI, while it will sometimes try to push you into dangerous locations, you're better off just not standing near them than relying on making that skill check to avoid being shoved into lava or whatever. Just don't stand next to lava, just good rules for life as well as video games. So for acrobatics, I'm going to place it in B tier. It is very useful when it comes up, but significantly less useful than its counterpart, athletics. Sleight of hand is used in two circumstances. One, when you want to... or I guess three circumstances, actually. Um, one, when you want to unlock a lock, two, when you want to disable a trap, and three, when you want to pick someone's pocket. All of these are extremely important uh, actions to have access to. Po uh, picking pockets, if you have good sleight of hand, is a source of basically infinite free money and resources throughout the game, because the merchants will regenerate their inventory, which you can then steal. Um, and every party is going to need to open locks and bypass traps. Many traps in the game you can bypass by throwing stuff at them, or by drop clogging vents, by tossing something on top of it, throwing stuff at tripwires, and so on, but there are many traps that you do actually need to disable, and it's really important to be able to do that uh, on your first try, otherwise you're going to take the trap damage. This is especially critical on honor mode, where there are many circumstances where you're going to need to navigate a trapped area, and you had better be able to succeed on your sleight of hand rules in order to do that without triggering trap damage. There's no reason to be taking trap damage in the game because it's something that you can avoid for free as long as you can make those sleight of hand checks, so you definitely want to 
have access to a way to do that. And of course, while there are other ways to open locked doors and chests, sleight of hand is the easiest and simplest, and every party should try to have access to sleight of hand. Stealth. So stealth is a weird one. The you may have been able to guess, of course, that I'm going to play stealth in the S plus tier, because it by itself can win you the game. Stealth allows you to make attacks and then not be detected by enemies if you have a high enough stealth score. This lets you make free attacks outside of combat without triggering combat, and if you have a high enough stealth score, maybe with use of Pass Without Trace, greater invisibility, advantage from uh, your your character race, maybe Lightfoot Halfling to reroll ones, you can guarantee that you pass these stealth checks um, combined with an invisibility effect and pretty much end every encounter before it starts just by shooting enemies with stealth arrows. They then fail their, their perception check to see your character and you get to just kill them all before they ever know you're there. This is obviously incredibly powerful. It's something that every party can benefit from, and it's critically important to most solo strategies in the game. Um, while I think that the Stealth Archer isn't the only way to solo, you'll often hear that it, or you'll often hear that the Stealth Archer is the only way to solo Baldur's Gate. I disagree with that assessment, but it's certainly a very, very strong way to solo Baldur's Gate on high difficulty settings, and you need good stealth checks to have access to it. Something that is worth mentioning about stealth is that if you aren't cheesing enemies from outside of combat, it's less impactful than you might think in terms of actually making sneak attacks and stealth attacks. This is because enemies only ever roll against your stealth if you are in their lines of sight. So if you make if you hide your character outside of enemy line of sight, they'll never roll to detect your character. So you can, even if you are the clunkiest paladin in heavy armor with no points in stealth, you can still be perfectly hidden as long as nobody's actually looking at where you are. This lets you bypass stealth checks, but also, it sort of more importantly, lets you get use stealth with non-stealth characters. Um, so I don't think that's a, a knock against the stealth skill, but it is something to keep in mind when you are actually trying to hide your characters. All right, that's all the dexterity skills. Let's talk about the intelligence skills. These, I think it's pretty tempting to group all together because these are skills that only come up in dialogue or when kind of investigating something or looking at a, a specific object. They're not skills that you ever use in combat or anything along those lines. So basically there's no organic non-scripted way for these skill checks to come up. They only will ever come up if the writers decided to include a a check there for you to, to make. Um, for that reason, there are two things that hold them back in Baldur's Gate. One is that you can't have these skills usefully on non-dialogue characters for the most part. If you, because how Baldur's Gate works, only the character that's actively doing the conversation can roll skill checks for it, which <laughs> incidentally is one of my least favorite things about the game. Um, this means that if you are talking with your main character and have Gale standing nearby with high arcana, Gale is just sitting there with his thumb up his nose, just completely not contributing while your character tries to figure out magical history or whatever. This means that you need to have these skills on a character that's actually going to be making dialogue checks or investigating things in order to use them, which limits their usefulness even further than the fact that they only get used when scripted. For that reason, I'm pretty much just going to go by whether, uh, by how often they come up in the game. And the answer is basically that um, all of these skills come up somewhere around uh, 30 or 40 times in the first act. You can look at the exact numbers in the guide below, which I will link, like I mentioned, except for Arcana, which comes up about 50 times. Anecdotally, I will say also that Arcana is the one that comes up by far the most often of these five um, 
five intelligent skills, and so it's the one I'm going to place higher up. I'm going to say that Arcana is fairly important because you make these checks quite frequently, and also it's often duplicating something that you would have gotten from one of these other skills. The game will very often offer you, like, can you, you can make an Arcana check for this, or you can make a History check. You can make an Arcana check, or you can make a Religion check. And so Arcana will often be superseding, having access to Arcana will often supersede having access to these other intelligence-based skills. All the other ones, I think, are basically C tier. Um, as long as you have one of these intelligence-based skills, and the one that comes up the most often is going to be the the most important of these, um, then you're going to be able to pass most of the dialogue checks for which it's required. There is some important mention uh, for religion specifically giving you inspirations, especially in the early game when you need them. So actually I'm going to bump religion up one tier, because... Uh, inspirations are, are quite valuable in Act 1 specifically, where it's often harder to get them, and there's several religion checks you can make in the early game to stock up on your first four inspirations. You can have a maximum of four inspirations, which let you reroll a really important skill check, like, for example, disabling a trap with sleight of hand. Animal handling and the other wisdom skills are pretty interesting. So, Animal handling lets you make skill checks to interact with animals. However, there is a spell in the game that requires no resources and bypasses, as far as I know, 100% of all animal handling checks that you'll ever make during the game. If you have speak with animals, you can use persuasion, uh, you, you can either use dialogue skills or simply bypass every single animal handling check that you would otherwise make in the game. Uh, there might be like one or two exceptions, but if so, I haven't encountered them personally. If anyone knows of one that you can't use speak with animals to bypass, then definitely let me know. Um, but for that reason, animal handling is as far as I can tell, 100% or 99.5% completely useless. Just if you would want to make an animal handling check, instead just drink a potion of speak with animals or have speak with animals available in your party so that somebody can cast it. And this will let you bypass every animal handling check you would otherwise uh, be making, which is a little sad, but given that we can't ride horses or anything like that, sort of inevitable for this game not to include animal handling checks. Something that I should also mention here is that um, I'm talking specifically about these skill checks in Baldur's Gate. If you were to go on and play a, a tabletop game under a DM, then how they set up their skills their, their skill checks would significantly affect this tier list. For example, a DM who likes to give you background lore and advantages, you may want to inve uh, invest more heavily in history or investigation or something. So this is specifically only for the, the Baldur's Gate's implementation of these skills. Um, I don't know how many people go on from Baldur's Gate to play tabletop D&D, but I think it is kind of important to mention that things are not exactly the same because the world will react to you thanks to you having a DM who will be able to do that for you. Insight. Insight is functionally the same as the other uh, uh, dialogue skills, the, char the charisma skills, or the same as the investigation skills. It can only be used during dialogues or uh, interactions with objects, scripted events in other words. And it comes up significantly less often than all of the charisma-based dialogue skills. So while there are cases where you're going to roll insight, and it does come up occasionally, most of the time it is going to either give you a, a an edge that you would be able to get anyways just by making a, a persuasion or performance check or something like that, persuasion or deception or intimidation check, or it's going to give you um, marginal information that you don't really need. The in insight, from my anecdotal experience, is very rarely a source of inspiration. Um, it might depend a little bit on your, your character backgrounds, but in general, the ways that these knowledge skills work to give you advantages is by giving you inspiration. Insight doesn't do that that often. It does sometimes give you some advantages in dialogue, but not nearly as many as the actual dialogue skills, so for that reason we're going to place it in C tier as well. Medicine. So medicine is very interesting, 
just like uh, many of the other wisdom skills, it mostly only comes up in pre-scripted moments in conversation. There's a couple really important ones of these, though, uh, one in Act 2 and one very early on, which I'll actually spoil, because it can give you advantage on the roll to um, extract the brain and get us on the nautiloid. This is basically the first thing you do in the game, so I don't think that's a, a particularly important spoiler. Advantage on that roll is actually very important because us is a very valuable combatant and also gives you a powerful resource um, later on on the nautiloid when you're trying to win the Cambian fight and as, as well later on in the game. Medicine also has a non-scripted use in one particular circumstance that makes it significantly better than it looks at first use, at first glance, and that's that a level 6 transmutation wizard can make a medicine check in order to get two potions instead of one when doing alchemy. If you have a level 6 transmutation wizard, and remember that you can respec a hireling or just a companion who stays at your camp, making potions for you and have skill in medicine on them, it becomes incredibly powerful because it doubles your resource output when you're trying to make the extremely powerful late game potions. Elixirs of cloud giant strength, bloodlust, and so on, getting two of these for every one makes it much more likely that you'll have them for important fights and important long rests. You get important potions like potions of speed much more often in the early game or in the in the mid game um, if you have the if you can reliably make this medicine check. So medicine on specifically your alchemist is very important. However, if you aren't using that particular uh, class, it's not very important. So with a transmutation wizard, I'm going to say medicine is an A tier skill. Without a transmutation wizard, it would fall somewhere in C tier, um, being useful primarily for one or two scripted events. It also does not similar to insight will not give you inspiration as often as the history or nature checks and, and so on um, but the use of getting multiple potions is just so powerful that it's worth bumping medicine up a couple tiers to talk about that perception perception is used in two major circumstances and occasionally in dialogue the two main circumstances where it's used are detecting stealth enemies and detecting traps now Baldur's Gate enemies mostly don't uh, stealth. There's a couple cases where you can detect them using perception, but for the most part you're using this to detect traps. However, that by itself is critically important. Like I talked about in Sleight of Hand, being able to detect traps and disarm them safely is massively important, especially for your honor mode runs, where you need to be able to avoid taking unnecessary damage, especially if you want to avoid frequent long resting um, outside of combat or wasting a lot of potions and stuff on damage that you didn't need to take. There are also traps in the game that can just completely end your run um, if you happen to miss them, and some of those are ones that there aren't really good ways to bypass other than actually disarming them, and so being able to find and disarm them is critically important. Perception does also come up in occasional dialogues, and something that actually kind of adds insult to injury when it comes to insight, um, which is very alliterative, is that there are a bunch of checks in the game that I think should be insight checks that you make with perception instead, um, although that's something that actual DMs are guilty of pretty often too, so it's not that surprising to me. But perception in general is going to come up massively frequently in the game. It's something every party should have access to, one of the best, generically best skills, and uh, if there's one thing that you should take as a lesson if you want to transfer some Baldur's Gate knowledge, to tabletop D&D, it's get perception on everybody, it's the most important skill in the game. Survival. Survival is used in Baldur's Gate only for detecting where you can dig to find chests full of random loot. In and of itself, this isn't that good because the random loot that you find in these chests is just not that important. You know, it's it's nice to have some additional potions, scrolls, some extra items, and, and whatever. Most of these are things you'll be able to buy from merchants instead, and in the mid to late game, money does not be, really become an issue. However, it's even worse than that because whenever you, you uh, fail a survival check, the game says you failed a survival check and what you can do is just select the shovel in your inventory and dig anyways and you can dig up those chests without having succeeded on the check 
For that reason, there is literally no reason to invest any points in survival. I think there might be one dialogue where it shows up during the entire game. Um, let me check what the, the Neo Seeker guide says. Neo Seeker guide claims there are five. I don't know if I actually believe that. Um, but even if there's five dialogues with survival, it's just really not that important. And its main use you can bypass with 100% efficiency just by digging in the location where the game told you you failed a check. You should pretty much always avoid putting points in survival unless it's for for um, flavor or just to uh, just because you have literally no other skills that you can select. All right. Finally, let's talk about the charisma skills. It's pretty tempting to lump these all together because they all fill basically the same role. You're going to use them to talk an enemy around to do something that you want them to do. Now, or, or an enemy or NPC or ally, um, they're used against your companions pretty frequently as well. And one reason I think that it's tempting to consider these as being all equivalent is that if you were playing tabletop D&D, they pretty much are. If you have a situation where you need to like talk your way past a guard or something like that, you can say, you could say, all right, I lie to him and say I have an important mission on the inside. I intimidate him and tell him I'll beat him up if I... Uh, if he doesn't let me in. I persuade him that it would be in the best interests of national security to let me in. You know, that kind of thing. Your DM might set different difficulty settings for all of these. Uh, but in general, you're going to be able to use any of these skills relatively interchangeably whenever you need one of them, if you are uh, creative and, and good at role-playing. In Baldur's Gate, though, you can only use them if the writers gave you the option to do so, and so the number of times when they come up is actually really important for determining which of these is good and which of these is less important. Given that, let's take a quick look at the, at the numbers, and we can learn that there are 293 persuasion checks, 209 intimidation checks, and 147 deception checks, as well as 44 performance checks, although I'll talk about that one in a second. What this means is that persuasion is wildly more useful than the other two, because not only are there way more cases where persuasion comes up, Almost all of the cases where the other two come up, you can still just use persuasion instead. Most of the time when there's a deception or intimidation check, there's also a persuasion check. And if you play through the game, you're going to you're gonna see that this... Uh, as you play through the game, you're going to see that that's pretty much the case in almost all circumstances. Persuasion is also the skill that is used in the most important dialogue checks in the game, which can let you bypass very difficult boss encounters, gain access to... Um, wildly powerful artifacts well ahead of where you're supposed to be able to, uh, and do all of some of the really coolest things in the game. For that reason, I'm going to say that persuasion is an important skill. You don't need it, it's not critical to your playthrough, but you can you can get by without any dialogue skills. But if you want to do any dialogue, then persuasion is one that you should definitely have access to because it will bypass almost all the things that the other two uh, dialogue skills do, um, and is will make a lot of encounters significantly easier if you can regularly make your persuasion checks. Deception, or intimidation, I'm going to say is useful because it comes up more often than deception. And deception, I'm also going to say is useful, um, in part because while deception comes up less frequently than intimidation, um, at least according to the guide, I think in general it is used to make more important checks. Um, and you can use it especially to avoid being arrested, which is a, a case that it comes up that's not scripted. Um, so you can you can use uh, deception, persuasion, deception or persuasion both to be to avoid being arrested. Typically, um, it depends on the location which of these dialogue skills are available to avoid being arrested and and who is attempting to arrest you. But I think almost always persuasion and deception will work. Some people will be intimidated and some won't. Um, but deception, while it comes up less often than intimidation, is typically for more useful checks, I think, in general. For performance, there are two uses. One is scripted uses in dialogue, of which there are a few and some of them are quite good. And one is to just make money um, and distract people. So when you start performing, you just make a performance check. NPCs nearby will come watch you sing, um, which can be 
used basically in place of minor illusion to pull enemies away from or to pull people away from things that you might want to steal or whatever and also you can make a little bit of money off of it i would say that that's got somewhat marginal utility but given that it has some utility and also comes up not infrequently in dialogue i think it is going to be better overall than most of the marginal skills um, so I'm going to put it in useful, but you could very easily put this in, in the marginal section as well. I think it's it's on the edge here. All right, so that is all of the skills ranked. As you can see, in S plus tier, we have stealth. In critical to have for every party S tier, we have athletics, sleight of hand, and perception. Important skills include arcana, medicine, and persuasion. Useful skills include acrobatics, religion, intimidation, deception, and performance. Marginal skills, history, investigation, nature, and insight. And completely and utterly useless skills, animal handling, and survival. I hope that you've enjoyed this look at the Baldur's Gate 3 skills. Definitely let me know if there are things that I wasn't considering that you would want me to move one of these skills around in order. Um, but I think this is a, a pretty solid basis. I think if you have access to these seven skills, or at least say five of these seven skills in the, um, in your party, you're going to have a pretty good run through the game. Um, I would recommend generally getting access to persuasion if you want to do any dialogue skills. So unless your your concept for your party is that you are very bad at talking to people, you should probably try to have access to persuasion. And of course, you only need medicine if you're doing the transmutation wizard. But in general, I think you're going to be best off, you're going to be best served by having at least these six skills available for every party. Um, and the others you can sprinkle into taste. All right, my friends, hope you've enjoyed this look at the Baldur's Gate skills. Let me know if you like this type of content, like tier lists and, and detailed discussions of this kind of thing. Skills is a somewhat simple one, of course. We could do tier lists for classes, feats, spells, etc. And as always, of course, if you enjoyed this video, do please feel free to subscribe to my channel for more of this and other strategy game content. Like the video, uh, because that helps with the algorithm, and leave a comment if you have something to say. Cheers, my friends. I'll catch you next time.